HVAC 360 is brought to you today by Job Site Clod Hoppers. It's 9 in the morning and your feet are already killing you. Wish you could just have a little foot massage at break time? Your wish has been granted! New from Job Site Clod Hoppers is our latest boot model, the Vibro Shoe. Fully ANSI and ASTM compliant, we just want you to kick your feet back at break time, and with a single press of our discreet remote, your puppies will be humming in no time. Super quiet operation means that no one has to know that you've just turned break time into spa time in no time. Job Site Clod Hoppers. Makers of fine footwear since 1566. Hey, what's up? Welcome back. This is episode number 117. Matt Nelson here, your host for HVAC 360, helping you be the best and the brightest in the field of HVAC. How do we do that? We do that by sharing lessons learned that we've gained in the field and talking with industry experts. But I don't personally stop there. I want to encourage you to double down on your weekly dose of HVAC knowledge by hopping on over to HVAC360.com and joining my growing community of people just like you. Uh, enrollment has been closed now for the HVAC 360 membership site, but if you are still uh, interested, uh, just get on my mailing list and you'll be one of the first to know when it opens up again in a few months after I've uh, improved some things and added some more content. So, what's up for this week? This week we're talking with the BAS expert himself, Mr. Phil Zito. Building Automation Monthly Guru. So, in our discussion today, we'll be covering things uh, such as interfacing of equipment to the building automation system and some design best practices that engineers can implement when it comes to building controls. Uh, if any of this is really beyond you, please uh, go ahead and drop me a line at matt at hvac360.com and we will see if I can come up with some additional uh, podcast that uh, spell out some more of the basics. Well, that's it for now. Let's cut to the tape with our conversation with Phil Zito. All right, today we have uh, Phil Zito, who is the founder and CEO of Building Automation Monthly. How are you doing today, Phil? I'm good. How are you? I am fantastic. So Awesome. <laughs> so why don't you give us a little bit of idea about your background in temperature controls? Yeah, so I got into this completely on accident, got out of the Navy, had a choice of being a soap manufacturer technician, a glass plant technician, or working on this thing called building automation. Had no clue what I was doing. Went on Wikipedia, Googled enough to pass a job interview, and got sent two weeks later out to program a central chilling plant. Um, suffice to say, uh, you need to know how to do that prior to doing it. So I learned a lot on the job. And over the years, went from tech to manager to sales to ultimately about seven years into my career, running the technical integration program for Johnson Controls, building all of their integrated smart building systems and architecting all that stuff, writing backnet stacks, etc. I uh, ended up wanting having an itch for entrepreneurship my entire life. And listening to all the online business folks saying, hey, if you want to start a business, you got to a, write a book. So I wrote a book. Then they said, hey, you got to have a podcast. So I had a podcast. All of that somehow turned into a uh, online teaching business. And you know, I just realized as I started to teach people online that there was no vehicle for uh, tradespeople to learn building automation. Uh, outside of hands-on or four years in a college. And so that was our niche and continues to be our niche. But we've expanded beyond technicians, and now we teach salespeople, managers, project managers, programmers, uh, basically everything they need to know about building automation so that they can be more profitable on their day-to-day -day jobs. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it seems to me, at least looking at the industry for the past, you know, 20 years as I have, um, it, the only place to really learn about temperature controls is 
with controls manufacturers. I mean, it seems it's it almost seems like this, you know, private secretive type of information that they don't want to divulge or, or, or hand out. It's just so hard to get to. Yeah. So I, I think it's a little bit of that. Um, I think that that honestly gets overplayed by some folks uh, who just, I don't want to say don't take the initiative, but it's kind of like if you're learning something. So I was talking with a buddy of mine, Skip, this morning, who does recruiting for the building automation sector. And we're talking about a certification for building automation and how, you know, in commissioning, you have to be certified. Well, and in test and balance, you have to be certified. Well, there's no certification in BAS. And I was telling Skip, I was like, Skip, you know, that seems like such a huge task. And I said, I've learned having written a book, having created an online training business, that when it seems like something really overwhelming, that what it usually is is you just don't know what you don't know. You don't know what that first step is to take. And that's why it seems overwhelming because you're like, oh, crap, if I take the wrong first step, I'm just going to mess stuff up. So as you mentioned, a lot of folks only go through manufacturer training. And then they learn in the field. The only problem is, is that you're trying to take someone who usually doesn't have any context related to what you and I do. And in five days, you're trying to teach them, assuming they have that context and hoping they remember everything after they get, you know, three months later, the opportunity to actually apply what they learned. And I think that has been the biggest challenge with manufacturer training because the trainers are good. I've, I've got memories of great trainers. The problem is the delay between actually utilizing what you learn as well as having the context around why you're learning what you're learning. Now, I guess what if we if we take a, a little step back here, what are some of the biggest disconnects that you see uh, between uh, mechanical engineers, <coughs> HVAC engineers, and uh, control contractors? So... For one, I think we don't give, um, especially consulting engineers, so I'm going to step back from mechanical engineers and just talk about consulting engineers first, and then mechanical, and then down to contractors, right? Kind of niching even more specific as I go. So I think especially when we're talking outside of plan and spec, because plan and spec's a beast in itself, but if we're talking design build or IPD or any form of really you know owner-driven smart building, which is kind of what all the buzz is about right now. You've got these consultants who need to know a little bit about everything. And I feel like we as an as a field organization, we as a building automation organization do a poor job of educating consulting engineers around use cases. We do a great job of educating them around our products, but we do a poor job of how to actually implement our products in a use case. So taking that a step further, you move to mechanical engineers. Now you're getting to folks who have a little bit more expertise. But once again, they're primarily focused on HVAC products. And so getting them to understand controls and how to apply that um, is very difficult at times. And often they will just use guide specs because, as you know, the margin pressure on a specifying engineer is extremely high. They they operate on thin margins. Everyone thinks they make a lot of money. They really don't. And then contractors were held to the contract. I mean, hence the term contractor. So our ability to actually execute contracts comes full circle to being able to influence the specifying engineers but uh, now you're seeing kind of the, the catch-22. You're on a job, so you can't influence it now. But if you influence it, you're taking your salespeople and your technical talent away because they have to be really involved to influence a job. I don't know if that was the answer you're looking for, but that's kind of the dynamics I've seen having worked on hundreds of buildings. Right. You know, and, and I think, you know, regardless of regardless of pay, because I think there's there's a couple of different things that are that are out there, you know, not to say that mm -hmm. engineers don't get paid well, but the the mechanics of a project, uh, the margin mm -hmm. there, the, the profit margin, what you're referring to is is very is very tight. 
because they don't they don't want to overbid a job. So they're working on yeah, a exactly. thin thin margin, and they're really they're, there's a pressure to produce uh, produce products, produce projects fast. So and that's where you're mm-hmm. getting. They don't have the time or the knowledge really to spend getting to understand what a control spec looks like. So yeah. what you end up with is uh, invariably with what I've seen is a performance based control spec. I've, I've I've rarely seen anything but that. In fact, is, has that been your your experience? So first, I think for the audience, we should define what performance based control spec is. Okay, fair enough. Um. So I don't know if you want to take a stab at that, and then I'll give you my opinion, or vice versa. Doesn't really matter. No, go ahead. Okay, so performance based is where. So, so for example, you're building a building, and it has a purpose for the building. That is a performance versus you're building a building and you're specifying the exact pieces. So, and then there's kind of a hybrid of performance where you specify maybe three specific lines or maybe a specific controls framework like Niagara, but you have once you've done that. Once you've specified, hey, we're going to use the Niagara framework or whatever product framework you want, then it is up to the contractor to look at the outcome that is meaning to be achieved from this building and specify the appropriate parts and pieces. That's how I take a performance spec. Right. And and usually the way the way I see it put together is generally speaking, there's going to be some sort of generic spec. And when I say performance-based spec, it's it's a generic mm-hmm. spec. Uh, it may have come from originally uh, from a manufacturer, and it does have, basically, it's going to have these components. And they kind of spell out, generally speaking, what those components should do and what they're you know, what they're, uh, should control. But they don't talk about quantities. They don't talk about uh, architecture necessarily. Uh, mm-hmm. But it, it just is, you know, ultimately it's, it's, a, it's a lot of words to say, make a complete and operable system, Mr. Temperature Controls Contractor. Correct. And, and I think that, so everyone taught, I, I hesitate to say everyone, whenever you use absolutes, that's kind of a, should be a red flag, but a lot of folks, um, talk about smart buildings and oh that digital building and the building of the future and da, 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 da. but the reality is we live in a world of performance specs as you mentioned for most plan and spec work so getting a performance spec mentality to be to implement a smart building i mean that's something we could dive into a little later if you want is extremely difficult but what i also find and so we teach a design course, how to build control submittals. Um, and the spec that we use actually calls for 4 to 20 milliamp 1K platinum sensors for everything. I didn't write this spec, but we use that spec just to show that if you go exactly by the spec every time, you can provide a lot of overkill. In this case, this was for a K through 12 building, and they wanted to provide four to 20 milliamp 1k platinum temperature sensors and you know wall sensors and it's just overkill and that is where you are going i believe is with this boilerplate approach you can actually either under or over engineer and you're just not delivering as good of a product as you could oh absolutely I, I think the most humorous thing, and if if anybody's who's looking at a set of plans, um, my, one of my favorite things to do is look for the the front end uh, hardware that is specified <laughs> in performance based control specs, because invariably it's it's outdated by at least five, if not ten years, and you know it it, it is just comical. Like you literally could not go and purchase something that archaic oh, yeah. from a hardware store. You you just you couldn't find it anymore because it doesn't exist. It changes so fast. So one of my yeah. fa- favorite things to do job to job is to look look for that hardware specification. Well it's true. It reminds me of a story, I don't know how true this is, of Motley Crew would go and whenever they would do a tour, 
they would put weird things into their tour setup specification. And they would say, like, for example, there must be a bowl of only brown M&Ms. And if they didn't do those minor things, that was a sign that they didn't do the major things because if they didn't pay attention to these little details. So, for example, you know, one of our students sent up me a picture of a Windows 95 machine that was in the spec, to your point. And it's, you know, a 486 Pentium 2 with Windows 95 on it. And it's, you know, you're like, uh, that, that, <laughs> I don't think you can buy that anymore. <laughs> no. And, it, and yeah, it just, you, and you couldn't even load your software on it. That's, I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's, exactly. it is just, it is just beyond. But I mean, that's, that's the point. That's, and I think in the whole specification, typically that's going to be one of the, one of the only things that you really need to update from time to time is the hardware yeah. because nothing else is very exact. It's just you're going to use a unit controller. You're going to have, you know, sensors and they're, they're, you're going to be like, you know, just general. So, but that the hardware thing just kind of gets me. So, uh, knowing that, what what are engineers supposed to do? I mean, how can they improve the outcome of their designs? I mean, that's a pretty big question. But what are some of the mm -hmm. little things they could they could do to improve? So, it's it's interesting you bring that up because uh, I do you know who John Petsy is, the co-founder of Tritium? Um, he's also co-founder of Sky Foundry and works on Haystack for tagging, mm -hmm. which tagging is doing metadata for your BAS data. Yeah, I've talked to John. Well, he sent me, yeah, so he sent me a message, uh, an email, because I posted this, hey, here's these tips to optimize your BAS. And he sent me an email, and he's like, hey, don't forget tagging. You know, a lot of folks are adopting it. So that brings up an interesting thought. I, this is something I was excited to bring up on this podcast episode. To your point, I think you are exactly spot on that the architecture of BAS for the most part has not changed. I will say that there's a much more IT-centric aspect of it now that we need to plan for, especially with IP controls. And what I mean by that is you specify IP controls, but the IT group that puts in the components for your networks typically do not do that until the building is almost completely built. So there's more of project coordination um, that needs to be factored in. I don't know how you exactly specify that. It's probably in the execution portion of the spec. Um, so I don't know if you want me to unpack that, but that's one thing is the IT impact of a lot of the newer BAS architectures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, Okay. Yeah. So basically what I mean by that is if you're using IP controls that require IT group switching or you're using virtual servers or cloud uh, servers, which a lot of um, BAS folks are using nowadays to offset cost, that's something that needs to be coordinated as part of the project. And as you know, because um, you work on the commissioning side, anyone who does not specify these kind of things is going to run into a room full of finger pointing as to who actually owns that responsibility come you know certificate of occupancy when it's not done and folks are like well i thought so and so was going to do it so i think that really needs to be addressed Oh, absolutely. You know, i mean I, it, it just as 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 simple as having, you know, like a just a a general architecture plan of, yep. of what the system's supposed to be like and just kind of, you know, even if you do like dashed lines around the okay, this is by this yeah. contractor, this is by that contractor. But I mean, you're you're totally spot on on the um, you know, the IT part of it because invariably they they don't want to even get in there until the building's dust free and you know yeah. they're ready to go. Um, so I mean, I don't. I mean, it's a double edged sword there because I you know I can I understand where you're coming from as far as it it you know that's going to be the way of the future, but yet I can't see uh, that really changing that much that fast in the actual I... world. You, are, so, so you, you disagree? Time and time again. Yeah, I, I, 
I disagree because of what I'm seeing. I disagree because so many of our students are coming to us with IP controls flat spec um, for their medium to larger projects. So projects that are 200 to you know ten million dollars in controls. I'm seeing folks coming with flat spec IP. Is is that um, some, is that something that um, is uh, new construction? New construction, yes. Okay. Typically not retrofit or uh, O and M. Additionally, something so something that's really easy for specifying engineers is putting in the submittal requirements in detail in uh, part one general of your specification, and ensuring that the execution part two. No, no, part two's material. Part three, execution, calls out that um, your initial control submittal is required before any work takes place, when it's required, and uh, what's supposed to happen after it's submitted. I mean, just having submittal requirements and actually reviewing the submittals prior to allowing because contractors are savvy we're going to try to order material as fast as we can store it in a job locker on the site so that we can claim the materials on site so we can bill you for the material um i mean that's the reality of what we're going to do right so going and getting ahead of that making sure that the control submittal is the first thing that is done and making sure you're detailed about your expectations for a control submittal um that is an easy thing that can be added to specifications. And what what speci- and then, what what specifically oh, you know are you looking for as far as expectations that you as far as the control submittal? Yeah. Um, well, you got to have the controls drawings. You got to show that the controls engineer actually went through the mechanical plans and the specification, and that they understand the sequence, and that the sequence is on the drawing, so everyone's on the same page uh, as far as what systems are going to be controlled and how they're going to be controlled. I mean, I'm reminded of a job that I did for a school district or a university for a music studio where the specifying engineer had fan coils that were cooling only. And his idea was that he was going to mix outside air with this cooling only unit and that would clear up the humidification. And this was in South Texas where it's very humid. And I pulled out a psych chart and showed him that there's no way on this planet that the laws of psychrometrics would allow this to happen. Um, And they decided to go forward anyways, but it was all taken care of in RFIs and through my submittals. Um, so that when it came around at the end and they had to add electric heat to all these fan coils, we were covered. Yeah, no, it's, it's, that's, that's, I think that that's a critical, critical component to it. Um, now I guess one other thing, do you have any other tips for, uh, before we move on? Oh yeah. So my, my last thing would, to, and this is a tough one. Because remember, engineers are under margin and time pressures, as you mentioned. But they really need to educate their owner customers about creating a naming and data standard for any BMS system that's going to be, or BAS, and you notice that's another thing we do in our trade. We have BMS, BAS, BEMS, EMS, etc. But any building automation system that is going to be larger than one building really should have a naming and data standard, especially with tagging and analytics and all the future stuff that you may want to do. You're not doing your owner a favor if you don't help them create that. And it's also a way that engineers could make some more margin and differentiate themselves. No, absolutely. I know, I know that I've probably mentioned that a dozen times on um, previous episodes with, yeah, you know, just, I mean, just simple tagging of equipment. Yep. Because it's just, especially an institutional. Yeah, even physical tagging. Right. I mean. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a nightmare. Yep. So, I agree. All right. So let, let's move on a little bit to, uh, to integration. Can you explain what integration, and I guess, if, at least from my, my standpoint, I'm looking at it 
not necessarily from a a front end standpoint, but you're connecting your building automation system to uh, a certain piece of equipment that may or may yeah. not be plug and play, shall we speak? Yeah. So there's so integration is probably one of the most confused and misunderstood topics out there, and rightfully so because you have what you just described as interfacing. When you are tying in via like BACnet or Lawn or Modbus to another system, you're truly interfacing with the system. You're just tying into an interface and the overall capabilities of the system does not change. You, you don't all of a sudden have, like for example, if you take a BAS system and you actually integrate that BAS system into the AV system so that the end user uses the AV system to actually change their zone set points and change their occupancy. That is an integrated system. It's two disparate systems that are integrated together. Now, if you're going to a chiller, an air-cooled chiller, and it has a backnet card, and you're interfacing that backnet card into your BAS, you're still a BAS that's controlling the HVAC. I know that's a very, it seems very nuanced and nitpicky, but it's very important because of a concept called use cases. And this is where integration really goes wrong, is where folks don't think through why they want to do it, what the ROI is, how they're going to maintain the integration. Um, because let's be real, you you pull in a chiller via a BACnet interface card, and all right, you pulled in the chiller, the likelihood of anything ever happening is very slim. However, you take your BAS and you pull in a lighting system, the manufacturer of that lighting system decides to upgrade their lighting system with some sort of lighting firmware, and now your integration's broke. That happens very commonly. That That is why I'm so nuanced on the differences, because it's a completely different approach. Uh, system integrators are folks who make multiple different disparate systems act as one. Regular BAS contractors will do simple interfacing of tying in a lighting system or a TVIS or a PDU or something like that. All right, so let's talk about inter interfacing then, because mm -hmm. I, I know sure. I, depending on the intelligence of the equipment that you're specifying, um, if it's a piece mm -hmm. of dumb equipment, usually you can just manhandle it and and everybody can you know take care of it. But when it's something that's intelligent that has that wants to kind of operate on its own, and you're trying to inter yeah. interface it, I guess interface it with the building automation system, there's a number of different things that can go wrong with that that interfacing. So what, absolutely. So what should what should engineers just be aware for aware of? in as far as the uh, the different pieces of equipment what what could they end up with what what should they specify so one of the most common ones there's a lot of folks who are really interested in vrf systems i'm sure that you've been asked about this i know you've talked about it um but vrf systems are kind of the big flavor right now right right so the thing with vrf is there's multiple different ways just to sequence the fan coil units on that system. You know, you've got ones with reversing valve. You've got ones that are isolated from the line. I mean, there's so many different ways of doing it. Thing is, is that when folks, it used to be, I've got a chiller. It's going to have these set points and it's always going to have these set points. And when I say set points, I'm not saying set points. I'm saying this set amount of points. Um, but when you've got these configurable smart systems that can be completely different, you can have completely different sets of points. And a point is an object that allows you to monitor, adjust, or control that piece of equipment. And so when you have all these different points... That is one thing, right? So you've got to make sure you've got the right points to pull in. But the more important thing that I see is these blended sequences. 
once again, using the chiller example, because it's just so prevalent, you now have a smart chiller and the chiller is going to be doing its own thing. But the BAS controller is controlling the pumps and is controlling the mixing valve. So now you've got the chiller controller, which has its smart analytics and all that built into it, and it's doing its own thing. But then you have this opposing force in the BAS controller, which is controlling pumps. And so you've got, as an engineer, you need to know that. You need to know what sequence that chiller is really capable of and either you, which honestly, I think it should be the engineer's responsibility on this because very few BAS folks have a professional engineering license. So, you know, shame on folks who pass it on to us to actually write their sequences for them. That, that shouldn't be happening. But it should be on them to understand the actual sequence of the piece of equipment and the actual sequence of the BAS and how the two shall merge, because I see a lot of conflict between the two. So, and I totally agree with you on the, uh, as far as, you know, the engineers writing the, the writing the proper <coughs> sequence. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of things to be said, you know, because obviously you could specify as a, as a base, basis of design, one chiller, and then you end up with, you know, uh, chiller B or chiller C. Mm -hmm. But, and obviously not all chillers behave the same way or have the same sequence. Yeah. So I think, it, you know, there again, once you know in the submittal what's going on, you know, maybe you take a look at your sequence and, and make sure that you can verify that that's, um, that's what you can do. So True. I guess one of the, one of the things that, that I'll, I'll throw out there that I mm -hmm. see happening and it's, it's, you have a, a pseudo-intelligent piece of equipment, and you want to be able to interface with it, but you don't know what it's speaking, um, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, yeah. So it, you know you have, uh, you know you want to get from point A to point B, but you don't know exactly what to do if it's a, a Modbus output, whether it's a, you know, MSTP, whether it's, you know, uh, IP, um, what have you. And I've, I've run into a, a situation recently where they literally had to take five different steps to get from the piece of equipment to the input on the uh, controller. Yeah. So, and it's, it's amazing to me. I mean, how can, how can anybody figure this out? Mm-hmm. So let's dive into that example, right? What piece of equipment were they trying to pull in? It was a humidifier. Okay, so like a Nortec humidifier? Sure. Okay, and it probably had like a Modbus output or something? It did. It actually, or I should say, it didn't. It had the option, mm -hmm. but... It, it had the option. It had the, had, had the option that wasn't specified. Mm -hmm. So. And so then they added the option or they just ad hoc went and did like some physical connection to the system. No, they, they actually added, added it in afterwards. Okay. So then, and there's a reason why I'm going down this path. So they add that Modbus gateway in, but of course the BAS for whatever reason doesn't speak Modbus. So they have to go get the Modbus register list. Then they have to go to like field server or someone like that to get a, a gateway to do the translation and then they have to pull the gateway into the BMS and coordinate those points into the field controller that's controlling the air handler. Does that sound about right? It sounds about right. Okay. I've done this once or twice, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that is why I, I said earlier in the podcast, it's so important for the submittal that should have all been catched in the submittal phase in, in reality, that that should have been caught and that should have been the equipment submittal should have been reviewed along with the controls contractor. I mean, I just saw this on one of our consulting clients where um, the parts weren't properly ordered and we caught it during the submittal review phase, but that you're, you're spot on. So how do you avoid that? 
uh, it's a matter of someone has to step up and take responsibility for reviewing integrated systems. The best specs that I see are the ones that account for this and they write in the interfaces into the specs. Right. But I, and I, I just see from the standpoint of the engineer, the engineer didn't necessarily know that this was, this was a problem. I mean, it's, it's very easy to say, you know, draw a box, here's your piece of equipment, draw the bi- building automation system, here's another box, and then draw a line and saying, you know, here the, you know, the, the system, uh, you know, whoever the temperature controls contractor is supposed to, uh, is supposed to work with it. And the fact that they didn't specify the piece of equipment correctly is, is not in the picture. So it, it ends up being on the temperature controls contractor when it might have been an easy fix to have something added on uh, from the factory. Yeah. I mean, so if that were in my shoes, um, it's always it's always easy to play, you know, Monday morning quarterback, right? But if that was in my perspective, having ran an ops team and a lot of projects, first thing I would have done is I would have looked at the equipment submittal. I would have looked at the sequences and my designer would have went and saw that there was a humidifier and would have submitted an RFI to the engineers how they were supposed to interface. And if the spec did not specifically call out that we were responsible for providing that interface, then I would have submitted a request for clarification or, a, or just a change order right. for that right there um you know like i said it's always easier to look in hindsight but the reality is i mean there's a very specific process to any job that has multiple pieces in it and it is always to go and look at the whole system have a systems thought process and ask okay i've got this humidifier how am i going to control it now is you know obviously we're picking on humidifiers here and obviously chillers are another good example but how you know how are you supposed to know what is you know what what deserves more intention I mean you know you could specify a VAV box all day and it's never going to be an issue but what what are the problem pieces of equipment to interface like this Okay so herein lies the rub I would argue that 99% of the HVAC equipment, if you've done a couple integrations, is not too bad. It's not too hard to do. It's just a matter of getting engaged early enough in the contracting process to make sure that you ask the right questions and that the right parts and pieces get included. When you go out of HVAC equipment, that is where it gets pretty dirty. And that is because a lot of times you don't think through the use case. And um, I I will always hammer the importance of a use case. Unfortunately, in a plan and spec environment, you often cannot influence a use case, which is why I don't think you should do a smart building through plan and spec uh, construction vehicle. I think you should use a different construction vehicle. Um, But... With that being said, you really have to go and sit down with the stakeholders and figure out the use case and understand, okay, so we're integrating the lighting, the card access, and the BAS system together so that when someone badges into the building, the lights turn on and the HVAC turns on. Very simple use case. However, you have to go and sit with the stakeholders and say, okay, but what about when the janitors are in there? Do we still want that same use case to happen? What about on weekends? Okay, what if someone only has access to one floor? What do we do? And then you have to work through that use case. And then once that use case is defined, then and only then can you start to build out your technology architecture. That's why I think that that kind of integration is better served by like a design build or an integrated project delivery contract vehicle. So when we're talking about specific equipment, is is mm-hmm. the, is there something that engineers should ask, sort of like a manufacturer's rep? You know, okay, is is yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and and thanks for pulling me back. I can go pretty deep down the tech rabbit hole um, pretty fast. So at, at a high level, if I'm an engineer and I have something, I want to know what communication interface options are available. And then I want to understand the main protocol of the BMS system that I'm using. So if its main protocols are BACnet MSTP and BACnet IP, then I want to make sure that my equipment has an MSTP or IP interface. That's the easy way. And then it's up to the controls contractor to ask for the points list and stuff like that. <clears throat> gotcha. Excuse me. So uh, I think that's uh, at least that, that'll give some, you know them you know engineers something to you know work with you know just to just to make oh, sure that they oh, have yeah. you know interface options available. You know, not like, and I've, you know, I know I've run into uh, manufacturers reps because they, they, they vary in quality. Um, some of the good ones are worth their weight in gold. Other ones, you know, who are relatively new may not necessarily know what you're talking about when you mean interface options. So just be, just <laughs> engineers beware of, of that, of that difference. So I guess, you know, as far as from your experience now, I mean, obviously you have, you've had, uh, uh, multiple courses out there. What what do you think engineers really need to know about controls? I mean, they don't they don't have to install them or anything like that. But what what should they know at the at the bare minimum? So there's a really interesting concept that I feel if engineers really grasp this concept, it would not just help them from controls, but it would help them from lighting, physical security, access control, AV, etc. And it's the concept of the three-tier architecture. Pretty much every building system follows a three-tier architecture, which is you have a server, you have a supervisory device, and you have a field controller. So for example, with a BAS, you have a server, that's your software, your user interface, etc. You have a supervisory device that's often called your master controller. And then you have you know, your field bus that that supervisory device connects all the controllers and the controllers process the inputs and outputs. Now translate this to a lighting system. Once again, you have a server, you have a master lighting controller, and then that master lighting controller communicates to individual ballasts that maybe interface with light switches. And the same with access control. You have a server, a master supervisory device, and individual controllers that process card readers, and door locks. When you start to understand this, it makes it a lot easier to compare multiple different technology offerings and products because you can put them in that three-tier framework. So that is, if, if they get that one concept, it makes it so much easier because, I mean, temperature sensors have been around forever. Onicon flow meters have been the same Onicon flow meters since I started in the field. Maybe now they have BACnet interfaces, but they're basically the same thing. So understanding that architecture is important. Um, anything you want to ask about that? or No. Okay. Specific to BAS, um, they need to understand just the parts and pieces. You know, just understanding the parts and pieces, understanding how the parts and pieces are going to be used, understanding what can be done and what can't be done with a BAS. And that's relatively easy to learn. Okay, so just kind of those those two basic uh, components, um, they should have a, a good understanding. So what are some of the resources out there for somebody to, to learn this? I mean, we had a conversation earlier in the podcast about, you know, finding where to learn more about this. Uh, so what, what would be some of those resources? Where can they look? I mean, this is going to sound pretty egotistical, but <laughs> we're pretty much the only resource out there. Um, you know, that can teach it at a layman's terms every man's level sure you have engineering resources out there that are highly technical but um i i would recommend our podcast and our free blogs and then if they really wanted to dive deeper picking up our a to z program 
I know that seems completely self-serving, but I've just seen enough success from that with engineers that, and had them tell me enough times that everyone should be going through this. So, right. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. Fair um, enough. Outside of that, I mean, you have Ashray, uh, which the thing with Ashray is it's much more focused on sequencing and we don't we don't teach sequencing i have no desire to become an hvac sequence instructor we have a course on sequencing but it is truly from the perspective of how do you implement a sequence utilizing a bas versus how do you create sequences um so ashray does really well in creating sequences i think ashray standard 36 is the high efficiency sequence standard if i remember correctly but as far as components, parts and pieces, and just understanding the BAS industry as a whole, that's something we specialize in. All right. Um, so I guess what's what uh, what are some of the things? Obviously, with the Building Automation Monthly, we've talked about a couple of things that you have to offer the the podcast, the blog, um, the A to Z program. Uh, what what sort of what what sort of uh, things are coming up that are going to be uh, the new that you're working on? Oh, yeah. Great question. So we've got, I mean, as it stands right now, we've got over 10 courses. We've got a track for technicians, a track for engineers, a track for programmers, and a track for salespeople. Uh, this year, what we're looking at doing is building out an integration track and a project manager track of courses. And we're also looking at doing some in-person courses here in the Milwaukee area. Um, I've had a lot of folks reach out to us asking about in-person courses, especially owner customers who have asked because we're really good at helping folks create uh, their control specs and their uh, control design standards. Uh, but we're also really expensive to fly out to your place and do that with you. So they've asked, could we do that in a group setting? And so that's something we're going to look at here in the Milwaukee area is you fly out and we help you write your BAS standard, not to be confused with a spec, but actual a BAS standard for an organization. And then uh, you leave with a BAS standard. Now that's, that's, I guess, pretty, pretty important. I mean, if, at least from an owner's standpoint, you know, on the commissioning Correct. side, we have the owner's project requirements and usually that sort of mm -hmm. dovetails into some sort of building standards that they have, Absolutely. but it's also, I think, an, important to have a standard for your building automation system. Yeah, I completely agree, especially since a lot of the folks that have the tacit knowledge are retiring, um, so you can't depend on them to be there to be the voice of influence over a project. You need to ratify that knowledge into a document that then can be used on projects going forward. So now let me ask you this, now that we've kind of mentioned this, uh, I know a lot of, I've run into cases where owners have been sort of, I don't know, necessarily <laughs> held at gunpoint is, is, is a bad is a bad phrase, but they've held been held hostage by different controls mm -hmm. companies um, because they yeah. can't, you know, when something breaks, they're at the whim and mercy of those contractors to come in there at their rates to do the work. In in working up with this uh, uh, sequence, how do, how do you specify an like an open architecture? Yeah, so that's always been something that's bugged me. Is you know we beat ourselves into the ground to be super low on bid day, and then we go charge customers forty fifty percent margin um, after warranty phase expires, and everybody does it. Anyone who tells you they don't do it is full of crap. But um, it's just the reality of our industry, and I, I hate that. And it comes back, as you mentioned, openness. And I think openness, you first have to define what open is. You have open protocols. You have open procurement, which is, in most cases, what you're referencing. Um, and then you have open software, which is another example of where folks kind of get held feet to the fire. So let's focus in on open procurement. You know, the, the whole rise of Niagara came from their distribution model. I mean, they have a fairly large market share. Um, 
it's not necessarily that their product is massively better than anyone else's. It's their distribution model in that you can buy Niagara products from anyone. Um, so oftentimes folks will go with that kind of framework because they want the ability to buy parts from multiple different supply houses. Now, if you aren't in the, in, in the concern of buying parts and pieces, but rather you want to make sure that you can self execute and you have access to the software to support yourself. That's a whole nother topic of open software and open tools. This is where you have the software licensed to you and you have your own copy and you have backups of all the files. That way you can work on the stuff, work on your BAS. So there's kind of two dynamics going on, if that makes sense. Right. And I think it's, it's, it's relative, you know, and in some cases it, it's kind of not necessarily a, a huge <clears throat> point, but anybody who has uh, multiple buildings, institutional buildings, you know, they really need that uh, control over their built environment. And and I will tell you another thing I've seen. Um, so while a lot of folks go down the Niagara path and they go down it because of an open framework, I've also seen folks who specifically go with an automated logic, a Johnson Controls, a Siemens, et cetera, because those organizations have branch offices across the United States and they decide that, hey, we've got multiple buildings across the United States. We want to go with one of these organizations so that they can implement a standard that all of their branch offices will be held accountable to. So I've also seen that as well. Right. You, you can't beat support on a local level. Even if you have to pay, yeah. pay that 30 40% premium, that beats the alternative of not being able to work in a building. Or having, you know, 10 different contractors in the same state all working on different buildings. For some folks, that's fine. It really depends on the maturity of their organization and if they have the operational processes and structure in place to hold accountable the folks who are executing those projects. What we forget is a lot of customers build maybe one or two buildings in their career. So they don't have the same knowledge and expertise on the construction side that we do. Sure, they have it on the operational side, but they don't have it on the construction side. Right. Okay. Hey, um, I appreciate your time. Any sort of uh, any yeah. any closing thoughts that you have before we wrap up? Just that, not to feel overwhelmed. I've been saying this a lot lately because I feel like there's a lot coming at us in the industry with smart equipment, IoT, IP controls, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of folks are coming into the trade and they're brand new. Um, and it's easy to feel overwhelmed. And, and it's to not feel that way, to realize that it's like I was mentioning when I was talking about whenever you come upon a big task, it's always going to seem very hard because initially you don't know what step to take. But when you're early on, you can afford mistakes. Take a first step. And if you make a mistake, just adjust. That would be my advice to anyone who's listening, whether they're an engineer, whether they're a technician, an operator. I know that seems really cliche and kind of pie in the sky advice, but that has served me very well throughout my career. All right. Well, thanks so much for being on, Phil. Uh, glad to have you. Thank you. All right. Thanks again to Phil Zito for stopping by and taking the time to chat with us. Check out the show notes for links to things mentioned on the interview. Uh, you can find those show notes over at HVAC360.com slash 117. All right. Thanks so much for listening. I hope this is helpful. If you know somebody who needs more information like this, go ahead and pass this episode along. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, again, consider joining the growing community of people just like you over at HVAC360.com for some 
more weekly goodness. Uh, lastly, it, it would do a ton of good for the podcast and getting the message out, just sharing this information with everybody. Um, if you could give me a rating on Apple Podcasts, it helps spread the word, and I really greatly appreciate it. Uh, one of those people who have done that this week, I want to give a shout out to my latest review. Thanks, Tex, for your review. All right, and I'll give you a shout out too if you leave me a review in Apple Podcasts. All right, well, that's a wrap for this episode of HVAC 360. I'm Matt Nelson, helping you be the best and the brightest in the field of HVAC. And as always, know what you build and share what you know. 